All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the Department of Environmental Quality's Office of Environmental Education. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Chris Smith. I am your host every Wednesday at noon for this wonderful series that's been going on. Uh, this great partnership for quite a while now. Normally, we like to bring you this show inside the SECU Daily Planet Theater at the museum. Can't do that right now. So we're bringing you the show right here on the museum's YouTube channel. Again, every Wednesday at noon, set your calendar to it. We're right here learning something new, and meeting interesting people, and hearing great stories. Today, my guest on the show is Amy Stidham. Amy is the Therapeutic Horticulture Program Manager at Cape Fear Botanical Garden. Amy, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Glad you could be here with us. How are things going? Well, thank you. Yes, uh, the garden's open and we've been busy. So it's hot out there, but we're still out there. <laughs> That's wonderful. It seems like the last several months, one of the, the great things to be able to do is to get outdoors and enjoy some nature. Absolutely. So uh, where are you calling in from today? Are you out at the gardens today? I'm actually at my house. Um, we're running the recording from here, but I'm actually at work every day. And I go on the garden nice and early and I try to leave before it gets too hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, it must be nice to spend some time in the air conditioning every now and then. A little bit here and there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, I think we can be ready to go. I hope so. We'll see if it's all gonna work. Uh, everybody, sit back, grab your lunch, get ready to learn. Amy, All show right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so everybody can see my presentation. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. So today's topic is on Give to Grow and we're connecting the community to food, learning, and wellness. As Chris mentioned, I am the Therapeutic Horticulture Program Manager at Cape Fear Botanical Garden. I'm also a Cumberland County Extension Master Gardener volunteer, and I'm an NC certified environmental educator. So our Give to Grow program is really important to us and has allowed us to make, make a lot of connections, especially during our current circumstances where everybody has to stay at home or we have limited options. So here's an opportunity for us to, of course, give education to grow our healthy garden to um, give our harvested produce um, to nourish our communities, especially those that do not have fresh vegetables. Um, we also give ideas to all ages and abilities. This is where our therapeutic horticulture program comes into play, and that's to improve our wellness uh, or their wellness as well. And also to give our community to um, grow our connections, um, to try to find um, different things for people to do and allow people to come into the garden and explore um, in a safe environment all the interesting things that are out in nature and to learn a lot about science. So what we're going to talk about today is the Urban Agriculture Resilience Program. And this is a special award through U.S. Botanic Garden and American Public Gardens Association. The award funds uh, re-energized our garden and this takes place between June and will end the 31st of October of 2020. We grow food for the community and we provide education and uh, in doing that, we actually provide a lot of wellness, whether it's directly through nutrition or wellness in um, yourself and your health. So everything that we produce, we have to weigh and record. And we also donate um, in-kind items. So things that have been donated to us, like seeds and plants, we redistribute those to the community. And we also provide a lot of educational programs. There's actually also a special survey, and this goes directly back to U.S. Botanic Garden and American Public Gardens Association because they want to know how you've been affected by the COVID-19 um, epidemic. And also, they want to know um, how this program that they have um, established helps you. So why did we grow a garden? Well, obviously, I already mentioned um, food scarcity and the need for healthy nutrition. And everybody's community has um, a lot of people right now that don't have that ability to get to the store or to be able to get fresh produce. They can get a lot of canned goods and that's good, but providing a lot of the fresh produce that's really healthy is a nice opportunity for us to help with that. Um, we teach and learn when we're out in the garden and of course it's socially distanced. So this is the perfect opportunity for everybody to come out into the garden and um, 
we uh, I'll talk a little bit about all the health measures that we use when we when we get outside, but also it's for enjoyment, it's for relaxation, and for a sense of accomplishment. And who doesn't like the delicious taste of homegrown? So this is the Cape Fear Botanical Garden Vegetable Garden. Um, this was taken about a month or so ago, and you can see the general store. It's a building from the 1880s in the foreground, and in the background, you'll see the farmhouse, and then there's a corn crib off to the right. So within the Heritage Garden Complex, um, you can, we have this beautiful vegetable garden, and we've done a lot of work on it and established the beds, and we're going to talk about that today. So how did we connect our community? Well, we've actually, um, over several years, have develop community gardens and um, private gardens um, within organizations that allows them to grow food for um, the folks that they work with. So at Second Harvest Food Bank, we actually have over 32 raised beds. Now only four of them up front are currently being used, but those were really important. And as you can see in the picture, it says produce Saturday canceled. Now, normally when you go to a food bank, you can only go on certain days. Um, because the main distribution is to food pantries and to other bigger um, places for another redistribution. So typically they don't have a lot of public there, but when the public is there, it gives us this great opportunity to show them gardening um, front and center, and we can provide them herbs and vegetables, and we have a mobile cooking unit that um, shows them how to cook the food that they're gonna receive. So we get to talk to the folks and give out seeds and plants and other donated items that we may also receive. So that was a great opportunity. Currently, everything is closed down right now. So um, that connection's there, but we're um, just donating our produce right now. Fort Bragg Soldier Recovery Unit. Um, of course, that's on Fort Bragg. And uh, we have some beds that are within that courtyard that the soldiers can go and um, work with those gardens. And we have a few individuals that go and tend those gardens. Private gardens, as I mentioned, just like you and me, and day program gardens, especially for seniors. And of course, our local farms, they also contribute and connect with us. All of our extra produce is collected and we redistribute it. Um, a lot of the different locations that we distribute include Second Harvest Food Bank, as well as private locations, the volunteers, and local um, organizations that actually cook for the homeless. So connecting our community is also really important because we share our knowledge, we share our plants, and we share our volunteers. So what is therapeutic horticulture and how does this interact with the Urban Agriculture Resilience Program? As part of American Horticulture Therapy Association, and there of course is the website in case you're interested in finding out more information, it's a process that um, we use in order to enhance people's well-being while working with plants. So I'm actually trained to do this and um, you can get training through the AHTA. There's lots of different um, options, both online and in person. And there's actually an internship to do as well, to be fully registered. Now, therapeutic horticulture benefits. Why is this so important and why does it have, what does it have to do with gardening? Well, just look at all these things and don't we need this right now? <laughs> lowering your blood pressure, lowering anxiety and depression, um, improving focus, relaxation and control exercising, stimulating you cognitively. Um, it's overall better health and well-being. And of course, um, all of these activities, we adapt to different ages and different abilities. So that's the unique part of therapeutic horticulture. So what are some therapeutic um, gardening activities? Well, there's things like repetition and focus, um, using different steps and outlining the steps for people that have trouble trying to follow them, um, being very careful to assist only when needed so that they are empowered to do these things. Using all of your senses, that's important. Smell, touch, taste, um, watering, weeding, and deadheading. These things are really important to getting up close to the plants and seeing how um, the plants grow and then you nurture them. And um, typical activities like seed planting, um, harvesting, and preserving. All fun things to do, acquiring all kinds of different skills. Um, building structures, that's super important in a garden and um, lots of opportunities to get out the power tool if that's what you really need to do. <laughs> um, artistic outlets, folks that like to express themselves in different ways. Anything from garden art like scarecrows or wind chimes um, and even journaling. There's a lot of uh, writing that can be done in the garden. So how we started our garden. So take a look at that picture on the left and I expect <laughs> 
that it might look like that again someday, but right now it's looking pretty good. Look at the picture on the right. So um, how did we get there and how does this all work? So this happens also because, you know, um, we have to remember that we were in a pan we are still in a pandemic and it's very difficult for people to get out, but holding volunteer onto volunteers and um, having a garden actually be worked all the time, it takes a lot of effort. It's a lot of fun, but it does take some consistency. So veggie volunteers, this is a great opportunity. If you would like to come out to Cape Fear Botanical Garden, sign up on our website. We will be running the Wednesday uh, veggie volunteers until October 21st. We just have a little registration form and a couple releases to sign. And these are our health guidelines that I mentioned before. So as you can see, we wear masks and we social distance. And I have a um, hand washing station set up for you so you can wash your hands when you get there, wash your hands during um, while you're working and any other time. Also, we wear gloves when we harvest. We wanna protect the people that we give our produce to. We disinfect all of our tools and our high touch surfaces. So where do you get started? This is another good place for you to get started. And as a master gardener, um, I have access to this as well as you. Um, but I encourage you to join us and um, learn more about and learn more in depth about how to garden. So this is the vegetable gardening beginner's guide that you can get at your North Carolina Cooperative Extension and find out more about our program. But this is gonna teach you everything from site selection to soil and amendments, sunlight and air circulation, how important water is, weeds, pests, and diseases, and harvesting. So the first thing we're gonna, we had to do is, of course, evaluate the site. Now that looks a little bit cleaner than it did before. So number one, we had to get rid of some of those weeds. But realistically, when you're trying to put in a garden, you really wanna find out where is your sun and how it changes between summer and winter. You wanna know um, how easy is it to check on the garden, to tend it and to harvest it? What kind of drainage issues do you have? Um, where is your water source? So if you look to the back of that picture, you'll see the hose back there um, that's been intermittent, but that hose actually comes um, from our pond water. Our competition with trees. Notice we have a lot of trees towards the back, but none actually inside the garden. And of course your furry friends, everybody knows those. And if you work with our environmental educators, you'll learn even more about all these little critters and how important they are to our environment. So organizing, the drone picture up at the top right shows you the garden and you can see um, how long it is. I know it's kind of a skewed picture, but um, this gives you a good, you know, relative look at what do you really need um, in that garden? It kind of gives you good spacing and it gives you an opportunity to really think about and visualize what you might want to place and where you might want to place it. Um, planting calendars, there's one down there from a botanical garden as an example. You can get really fancy if you want, or like me, you just type it into your notes on your, <laughs> on your, um, your phone. Um, garden design is a lot of fun. I enjoy doing that. And um, you can make it any, any way that you want. Accessibility is important for you too. You wanna make it so that when you do set up your garden that you can get around. And of course, I mentioned journaling. Now, adapting it. This is the important part of therapeutic horticulture. Um, there's so many ways that you can grow a garden. And so check out all of these options. Um, these can all be found in your local hardware stores or online. I just pulled some pictures for you, but um, grow bags are kind of fun. The upper right picture, um, that's actually not a plastic pot. That's a grow bag that allows air to get um, into the root system and prevents the roots from encircling. Um, it's called air pruning. And it's um, also a great way to, um, to move it around if, uh, at the end of season, you don't want to have your container. You just clean it out, um, fold it up and put it away. <laughs> so there's also self-watering containers and you can see the vertical gardens, how interesting. And I think most people are um, probably familiar with on the bottom right, the um, straw bell garden. So this is our balcony garden up by our education area that overlooks our cypress pond. You notice in the left side of the picture, the aeroponic system. There's actually several on the market of different kinds, and this is on loan from the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. It um, is completely overgrown right now. <laughs> and we're waiting for the tomatoes to ripen before we switch over to our leafy greens for the cool weather. But it's a system where the basin at the bottom is filled with water, fertilizer, and we adjust the pH. And a pump actually shoots the water to the top and it trickles down like a shower, thus aeroponic. 
Um, we also can see that uh, containers and we um, adjust the sizes and heights of those containers to make them more useful to people when they do come in and work in the garden. And you see the V-trucks. Those can be purchased online in all kinds of different forms and fashions. Um, those are standing raised beds, basically. And you can either sit beneath them because you notice the wedge shape. Um, so you can roll up um, in a chair or a wheelchair. And you can stand and reach them without having to bend over. We also have a wire rack out there, a potting bench, and some shade cloth when it gets super hot. These are all kinds of adaptive garden tools. A lot of fun um, for you to um, experiment with, but really easy for you to, um, to use and to help with things like arthritis or um, if you have uh, problems with your hands or your, um, your back. These tools will all help you with making uh, adjustments to the way that you garden. And so what's so important about putting in a garden um, is the actual soil that you're gonna put it into. So you can get your free soil test kit over at the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Check with your county extension office to see if it's free. Um, Cumberland County is until November. And um, they check for the pH, which is really important because that's what allows nutrients to get into your um, plants. And it tells you whether or not to add lime and how much um, fertilizer to add. So get a soil test before you put in a big garden or even a small garden. And it's not for, um, the raised beds that just have potting mix in it. It's really about the soil that's in the ground. So soil composition, I'm sure everybody knows about this and all the different sand, loam, and clay, depending on where you live, you'll have um, different experiences with the way that you grow. But um, lots of opportunities for you to adjust um, with different amendments. And notice that um, I did put up some different container um, potting mix ideas. Um, that is completely different than say an in-ground soil and it has to do with the ability for it to drain. So um, I can help you with that if you um, need more information. Soil amendments and protection are really important because the soil itself, um, most soils are, um, are alive and um, they have a lot of critters in them and um, lots of different things that help the soil stay aerated. Um, and, one thing that's really important to add is compost. And everybody has the vegetable scrapings and the eggshells and the coffee grounds. And uh, there's a way that you can actually compost all this and use it so you don't have to go out and buy compost. But if you don't have enough, there are several um, varieties that you can um, purchase. And just make sure that it doesn't smell. And it smells very earthy if it does smell at all. And because you wanna make sure that it doesn't have um, anything that's uh, what they call, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the word, but um, basically it doesn't have enough air in it and so it doesn't smell real well. So you wanna also mulch away from the base of your plant. You don't wanna pile your mulch around your plants, but straw, grass clipping, shredded bark, these are just some opportunities or different options for you. How much fertilizer to add? Now, remember I mentioned the soil test. So you always wanna check because why spend money if you really don't have to add fertilizer and you certainly don't wanna add too much fertilizer if you have like say too much phosphorus, which is pretty, um, pretty common in the North Carolina area. So check and see what you have. And also um, if we don't have an, uh, an adequate amount, you'll basically have problems with your plants and you'll see things like yellowing, the purple leaves or the slow growth. And then there's an the option for, you know, you see over fertilization, like you get way too much growth and you're not getting the fruits on the plant. Sun and air circulation, so important to um, having a healthy plant. You need at least um, six to eight hours of direct sun and layering your plants from um, tall in the back, short in the front. And depending on which way the sun is, sometimes people even put lettuce behind something that's tall when it's really hot outside to keep it kind of cool. So keep that in mind when you're planting. Adequate spacing is really important because obviously with competition, um, everybody be competing for um, the nutrients in the soil. So space appropriately and your plant will actually grow and give you the best harvest and shade when necessary. And of course, today's a great day for some shade. <laughs> Knowing where your water is, you wanna locate your plants nearest your water source and also near to where you're gonna be. Um, try not to put it at way at the back of your garden because you probably won't go out there very much. Up close to the house, as, as close as you can get it, uh, making sure that you still have your full sun. And these are um, some requirements like an inch per week. You can check that by using like little small cans or rain gauges. Um, 
And there's soaker hoses and drip systems. And you can also use a timer. Garden challenges. Everything's about too much or not enough, right? So you'll see in the far right picture, um, you'll see some chewing damage. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that actually will um, stop the uh, nutrients from going up into the pepper plant. And of course, we had some disease on our um, pepper plants and you can see some chewing on the leaves. So adding too much or not enough fertilizer sometimes encourages this, um, things that are planted too close, not enough sun, and of course, insects. So here's some of our challenges. <laughs> Does anybody know what's over on the left? That little guy is the squash vine borer and he just tears up the vine. He gets inside. Um, the moth actually lays the eggs on the base of the plant um, at night. So we didn't see her, but um, that little larva got in there and started chewing everything up can do some real damage to a squash plant. Next picture is some fungus. And we found we didn't have to worry about this one too much. We just wiped it off and it was perfectly fine underneath. It kind of looks like bread fungus. The, um, a little more destructive is this little false Colorado beetle. Um, you can see its eggs and he just completely chewed up some of our eggplant. And of course the upper right is the downy mildew. And um, these are all things that you'll encounter, not to, not to um, stop you from gardening, but just to know that it could happen and you can be organic about this or use synthetic, it's up to you. But let's remember, especially from our environmental education, meet those beneficials. These are all of our um, benefic beneficial garden pests or, or beneficial um, garden insects. And uh, they eat all of these pests. And there's actually more of these than there are of the pest part. So if you see these, know the different stages. And that's what's fun about it because um, kids really get interested in this, um, especially looking at a ladybug. He almost looks like a little alligator when he's smaller. Um, being proactive, integrated pest management, preventing, avoiding, monitoring, and suppressing. Um, these are just ways of working in your garden every day, um, trying to keep good sanitation, rotating your crops, and um, making sure that when you do put in things, check for some hybridization, select hardy or disease and pest resistant varieties. That'll help you to, um, to actually get a good harvest, particularly when you don't want to have to deal with a lot of the problems that you typically see in vegetable gardens. Some more garden solutions. So like I said, proper site and spacing, um, watering at the base of your plant, using compost and mulch, fertilizer at the proper amount. And of course, all along the edge of our garden, we installed a um, pollinator garden. So it's full of flowers that, um, and different kinds of herbs that'll draw in our beneficial insects. And this will help pollinate our plants in the vegetable garden. Also, um, you can exclude pests by using a floating row cover. And you see the fencing over there and the um, bamboo stakes that have um, tied to it a pie pan that bangs and makes noise to um, hopefully detract the deer. We'll see if that works. <laughs> You'll notice in the picture in the foreground, that's a children's education area. Um, they get to uh, work with the compost and look for the microorganisms and the worms. And to the left is a raised bed where they can do some planting. So that's a lot of fun for them. So include things in the garden where you can do some education, little stations. So growing it, grow what you wanna eat. Um, and I mentioned a couple of these things before and of course crop rotation. Now we're getting into the cool season. So we're pretty excited, um, but it's, uh, what is it? 107 heat index today. I don't think I'm putting my lettuce out today, <laughs> but let's see what else we can put out. Look at all these great vegetables. And a lot of these have some good um, store time. So um, over the winter, you can either cover it with a lot of um, straw mulch, um, particularly with the carrots, or by putting them in the fridge or in a cool place, um, you can have them throughout most of the winter. So herbs and flowers, don't forget those. And look at all the ways that you can use an herb. There's seeds and leaves, the flower itself, even the roots, and using them in meals and um, dips, refreshments, teas, etc. We have, of course, um, options for limited space, and you can see the trellis there. And succession planting means plant every two weeks. You can also go vertical, um, and those, that's a bean pole right there. So using fencing or um, also back in the picture, adapt it. They had those little pouches on a vertical uh, stand. That was fun. So seasonal tips you see in the right-hand picture, um, that's a floating row cover basically over some PVC pipe that's made into a hoop. You can buy these things inexpensively. Um, 
try to, you can use wire or anything else that you have, some little drip line, and you can make your own little hoop house. And the other thing people really enjoy doing is companion planting, um, getting the scent and the pollination um, and using root versus the sun competition. Basic, basically looking at the plant and, one, and knowing whether or not it's a root plant versus a, an above ground plant and they can work together. Plus the scent like of a marigold detracts from other uh, insects. The timing, we wanna prevent the bolting. The bottom right picture is the cabbage that's bolted. So putting in your lettuce and things too early will send it to flower. And when it flowers, it's just trying to save itself because it's gonna make seed. So how to grow, that's a speed tray under a grow light. Um, and lots of options for you guys. Um, if you wanna test some old seeds you have, there's a way that you can do that by using a little paper bag. I think a lot of kids do this um, in school. And you also wanna buy them fresh if you can, the seeds, and also keep them cool. Growing your seeds, uh, read the packet. It might take six to eight weeks before you transplant it into the garden. So you need to start it at your house. Now, currently we can actually put them outside in a shaded area and they grow perfectly fine. Some um, of the cooler crops might not like the heat. So you have to find a cooler area in your yard to do that. And of course, hardening off um, is gonna be important if they were inside to bring them outside because it's so hot or vice versa in the winter. Hardening up, uh, excuse me, if uh, you have a, see this little seedling at the bottom that fell over, um, that little seedling had a little fungus on it. So it was called damping off, but um, sometimes our seeds don't always, um, are not viable. Or in this case, they did come up, but something happened to them. So by using a fresh potting mix, that usually helps. You can also go to the nursery and buy some transplants. This is um, super easy to do. Not a lot of variety, of course, but um, they're ready when you're ready. Um, most nurseries don't have a whole lot out right now because it is so hot, but you're going to start seeing it um, pretty soon. So if you're um, wanting to learn a little bit more, this is great for education as well. You can learn to propagate. And so most people know about the um, garlic bulbs and separating those so that you can grow them. But there's also rooting basil in water, for instance, or taking a sweet potato and growing the little slips. And of course, you can always share with your friends. So knowing when to harvest is really important. Um, you want to pick frequently because of the plant will keep producing for you. You want to um, harvest when they're at the right stage. And of course, with the tomatoes, there's a breaker, st uh, breaker stage, which is just before the ripeness for a tomato. And you can take those off. And watch out for those hungry insects and animals because they will get in there. Um, how to harvest for us, we actually, like I said, mentioned before, um, we use a mask and gloves and we sort all of our produce and weigh it. And there's other kinds of herbs that we'll be shearing and trimming and we'll be drying so that we can use those for spices and dry rubs later. And we don't wash any of our vegetables before we give them away. We just make sure all the dirt's off because you don't want to wash them until just before you eat them and that keeps them from getting any kind of fungus on them or mold. Now, preserving your house, so many ways to do this from collecting your seeds to up above left where I was talking about keeping your um, root crops in a nice cool area and drying your herbs, all kinds of things you can do. So what do we do with our harvest? So this is the food bank and we're dropping off a whole bunch of food. And so far we have over 400 pounds from our gardens and local gardens that has been donated. And these are all the places that we've donated them to. Other donations I mentioned before is we have free seed packets, extra transplants or trimmings that we have from the garden and people can go home and root those. Um, garden supplies that we may receive or local donations of dry goods. I've had some come in and we just bring those over to the food bank as well. So what can you learn from all of this? Um, environmental education, top of the list. Life cycles, adaptation, impacts of soil, water, temperature, and light. So many things that you can teach about and use the garden as your lab. Of course, math, you have building and measuring, um, sorting and weighing, reading and comprehension. There's a ton of things to read about. Reading the documents about all the different kinds of plants and insects, reading the seed packets, or learning how to actually um, place some fertilizer in the soil. Art and creativity, garden art to distract animals, um, add color or even whimsy. And of course, health and nutrition, how much you can learn from the variety of plants that you're gonna grow and all the vegetables and telling people like maybe what uh, vitamins they might receive from eating that healthy vegetable. Okay, final tips. 
you see the scarecrow in the background <laughs> that the scouts made. You wanna plan ahead, you wanna start small, you wanna test and prepare your soil. Take a look in your garden every day. Um, we call it scout the garden. Um, just look around and see how everything is um, doing. And also if you hand water, water to the base of your plant and go, and that gives you a great opportunity to go look and see how everything's working in your garden. Um, work together, get your friends or your volunteers um, and have some fun while you're out there and enjoy all of that bounty. So to know more, um, this is my information. You can email me at my uh, work website or at my work email. And also if you'd like to sign up for Veggie Volunteers, again, um, that goes to October 21st. That is the website right there. Look up your local um, county extension office and those are the things that you can receive from them. And if you have any questions, I'm ready. <laughs> Amy, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Excellent stuff. What a beautiful garden. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been it a has... lot of work. <laughs> oh, it, listen, it, it looked amazing. It, it's got uh, 1 million fewer weeds than my little vegetable garden does even my raised beds. So I think you must be doing everything perfectly right to have such well, a whoa, 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 whoa. Space. <laughs> well, I wouldn't That's say it. that, but I will tell you that we've had um, over 40 new people actually sign up to come in and volunteer, whether they're with a scout group or individuals, and um, they don't necessarily come back every week because um, we don't have more than um, 10 people at a time. But um, that's a lot of people to be interested and in, to come out and actually see what's going on and to get their hands you know, into gardening for the first time, even though with this heat, can you imagine 40 new people? I think that's great in just two months. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's incredible. So everybody watching, I'll remind you, you can leave your thoughts and your questions over in the chat box here on YouTube for Amy. And I'm gonna grab those in just a minute and we'll pose those to Amy and, uh, and get your thoughts on what our viewers are thinking about, Amy. But um, tell me a little bit about how a vegetable garden fits into the mission of the Cape Fear Botanical Garden. And I ask because I think of botanical gardens as, uh, you know, places to get outside, places where environmental education can happen, but they're also sort of like show places for beautiful flowers and, and plants, whether regionally or, you know, globally. So how, how does squash fit into that? <laughs> well, that's so true, but um, in our garden, we actually take a, another um, way of looking at a garden. The garden is um, not only just about the cultivated plants, but like you're talking about, where people go in and they're wowed as you come through and you see that beautiful fountain over by the cypress pond and the arbor with the roses and um, all the wonderfully smelling flowers. But um, inside that, as you start walking around the garden, um, particularly in the vegetable garden, you're going to notice things growing um, that are also cultivated in some cases, but are also wild, like pawpaw trees and the um, persimmon tree and uh, the grapes that are growing that we've installed. So lots of uh, different things um, just to experience the different types of plants, but those kind of plants actually draw in so many different little critters and different insects. And you can certainly learn a lot about what your environment is like. And then it really gives you a good experience of um, water and uh, drainage and sun and wind and all the different, we've had floods back there and how, does, how do plants actually um, react to that kind of situation? So drought, flood, we got it all. <laughs> but it's, a, it's almost like a giant lab with different locations for you to really explore. Okay, all right. Well, excellent. Thank you. I like it. That's cool. Okay, uh, I'm going to scroll over here into the chat box and see what's been happening. Uh, let's see the first one I've got. Oh, uh, Taylor was asking, did you start the garden in May of this year? Or had, was it already going and then you rejuvenated? No, it actually, um, we closed it down when we closed down. So um, I think that was March, mid-March, and uh, we didn't get back to work until about May. So um, all that time, nobody was in the garden except for our horticulture crew, but they were primarily in the front, in the, um, the local garden or the garden that was right around the building. So that particular garden was, was not being used. Megan says, 
I had so much trouble with squash vine borers this year. I think we all did. Uh, apparently you can add mesh around the plants when they're young to defer, deter the adults from laying their eggs in the squash plants. Yes, and there's um, a floating row cover that you can use as well. It looks like a very thin film type of um, sheet, basically. You can get those online or in some um, garden stores and you basically float it over the top of the plant. That keeps the moths from actually placing their eggs at the base. And that little egg is what is gonna hatch. So there's ways of, after the fact, <laughs> trying to use like BT or diatomaceous or just some different varieties that will um, are organic um, to hopefully capture that little um, critter. But unfortunately, once the moth is in there, I couldn't even find them. I don't, I did not see the eggs. I tried, <laughs> I don't know where they were, but I found the boar, he was in there <laughs> eating away. And boy, they can do some serious damage. <laughs> yes, they can indeed. Okay, Megan's asking, oh, this is nice. Do you have honeybees? Yes, we actually do have honeybees. Our hive, unfortunately, um, collapsed, um, but we're hoping to get a new one in the fall. So um, we had someone come over um, from the um, North Carolina Bee Association. They had donated a hive, and unfortunately, something happened to it, and all the bees left. And then we had, I think they were called um, wax moths, if I have that right. They sort of took over so they had to pretty much clean out the whole thing and um, we'll clean it and bring it back to us and hopefully bring us a new swarm of bees <laughs> but so far we've had some great pollination so they're around somewhere probably up in the trees and little nooks and crannies <laughs> and wasps of course and other kinds of insects are also great pollinators as well yeah i was gonna say uh, a vegetable garden in the middle of a botanical garden probably is just full of an incredible diversity of pollinators outside of honeybees. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. What do you recommend for spring seedlings if you don't have grow lights? Did you say spring seedlings? Mm hmm. Oh, so spring seedlings. Spring seedlings. Um, yeah, so in the winter, when you start, typically people start in February, and if you don't have grow lights, um, typical shop light, uh, fluorescent light, um, ones that you see maybe in a, a school, those types also have the full color spectrum. You could use those as well. If you have a bright sunny window, um, you just have to turn your tray to make sure that the plants don't lean over and get really long and leggy. But other than that, if you do have that sunshine in a little warm area, that would work perfectly as well. All right, Lisa is asking, do you think mental health providers are more aware of the benefits of horticultural therapy now than in the past? You know, I think um, every year it seems to get um, more traction with folks. I think for some reason um, it had never has really um, been as, I think, prevalent as we've hoped it had been because this is just like any other therapy, music therapy, art therapy, horse therapy, dog therapy. Think about all the different ways that you can have therapy. Garden therapy is basically just another one of those, but really for therapy to work, it has to be something that you enjoy doing. So for folks that really um, are interested in working with plants, this is a great opportunity for them to actually experience that um, wellness through the use of different um, techniques to work with these plants and um, to help uh, you know, restore motion, um, to help with thinking, and, and help with just general overall wellness. So hopefully it's gonna become more prevalent. Currently it's not, I don't even think it's um, been uh, um, discussed in our um, insurance, um, but I think hopefully it will. I think overseas it is in some cases, but that's something that they've been struggling with. Excellent, thank you. Let's see here. Uh, is the grant for the garden renewed every year? Okay, so this is actually what's called awards. Um, so it's award funds versus a grant. A grant you can actually reapply for. This one in particular was probably a one-time, um, um, I guess, project for them because they really wanna know about all these different gardens. I think there's 28 gardens in 19 states and they're drawing all the information from these folks and how do you guys do urban agriculture? And so the award fund was just for a particular amount of time just this year. I don't know if they'll do it next year. I guess if it's successful, they might try it again. Okay, all right. 
Uh, do you think that if a teacher wanted to incorporate this into their curriculum that they could, and if so, how? Yes, as a matter of fact, I've been to several schools and a lot of teachers have been using their outdoor gardens, whether that's right outside their window or they have it in their courtyard so that all the kids can experience it. Um, either they have indoor gardens. Um, it just depends on what the teacher's up for because it's sometimes a little bit of work um, and you do need some donated items, but engage your community and um, try to work out um, a project. And hopefully I think um, the kids will really enjoy it first of all, but there's so much you can learn. And I did a list for you on that slide that showed you math and reading and um, just using all the uh, different talents that the kids have. And I think they would really enjoy having some little green in their, in their um, classroom spaces. All right, we've got uh, Katrina is looking for some gardening advice, I think. Katrina wrote, any idea how much growing on a screen porch would delay growth or harvest? Because Katrina brought home a pepper transplant in May and is just now seeing buds and flowers. All right. So if it's a screened in porch, you got to get that insect in there or do what's called hand pollination. So if your screen porch, um, you're not leaving the door open. So the insects get in there to pollinate your plant. You'll have to take a little Q-tip and go from a male to a female flower or between different plants, depending on what you have. But um, if it's actually in a flowering stage and you can put it outside for a while to get the pollinators on it, that's great. If you can't, then try to use a Q-tip. <laughs> Now, in one of your photos, I think you had like a demonstration composting area that you said was used for education. Do you, does the garden do large scale composting? Yes, we have um, two other places. There, right to the side of our garden is a, an additional area that has a lot of the heavier compost that we really don't want the kids getting into. And sometimes you'll get ants and things. Um, so we monitor the smaller one to make sure that that's pretty safe for them but the bigger ones can be turned and you can either cold or hot compost. And then we have an even larger one that's basically off site from us um, down by our local community college. And that's for the heavier material. And they comp they basically compost that. Excellent stuff, excellent. Great. All right, well, Amy, thanks so much oh, for being welcome. on the program sharing us all the great gardening advice and the exciting programs that are happening out at Cape Fear Botanical Garden. Oh, super. I was going to mention one too that's coming up um, the end of this month. We actually have a, a free event and it's called Pondomania. And there's four times that you can actually enter the garden because it's, um, it's reserved time and um, a first come first serve for the number of people coming in. So we're going to have mass and social distancing, of course, but um, just sign up online at katefearbg.org and lots of art, music, storytelling, vendors, etc. So all free. So check it out. And we also have what's called a garden school um, where um, our environmental educators are assisting um, students with um, doing some education on virtual and also in person. Excellent stuff. Mm -hmm. so I hope hey, everybody, well, <laughs> I need to get out there. I've not actually oh. been. I need to come and visit. <laughs> I'll, I'll reserve my time slot soon. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the show. Hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, the link here on YouTube will stay active, so feel free to grab it and share it around uh, with everybody you know so that they can learn as well. And uh, let's see. You can follow the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter. They're at North Carolina EE, and you can get updates on all the great programs that are coming out of their office, including updates on this lunchtime discovery series. Uh, visit the Office of Environmental Education's website too, and you can see what programs are upcoming. There you can also sign up for the lunchtime discovery newsletter. And then every week you'll get a short email letting you know what guest speaker is coming up, along with the link to get to this YouTube video, which most of you probably already know that because you made it here, but stay connected. Also, check out naturalsciences.org. That's where you can find all of the live virtual events that are happening from the Museum of Natural Sciences and more great science and nature resources that are available. And as always, you can follow the museum. We are at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, many thanks to the digital team at the museum, the folks with the Office of Environmental Education, 
and all of you for tuning in. Amy, thanks again once more. And uh, hey, everybody, take care. Stay safe. We'll be back here next Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>